Hello everyone, I'm Tia of LSAT Unplugged, and today I will be interviewing our special guest, Loretta Coloma Jr. He is the Acting Director of Admissions at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, William S. Richardson School of Law. Director Coloma joined the admissions team in 2013 and has represented the law school at local career fairs and regional conferences over the years. He, he is an alumnus of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he earned numerous degrees, making him the perfect individual for us to speak with today regarding the law school admissions process. Thank you so much um, for being here today, um, Director Coloma. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me on the show. Awesome. Uh, so to begin, uh, could you give us a little background as to what led you to admissions? Um, I would say um, I was a graduate student at the time and um, an opportunity came up in the admissions office and um, I've sort of come up from sort of um, working within a, a more technical role to really learning um, a lot about how the admissions process works and kind of seeing many students successfully go through it and um, are now practicing attorneys. And so sort of that progression um, just kind of uh, in the system itself has always been sort of a rewarding thing. And so I'm glad to continue to be here um, at this point in time to continue to see what happens as the school turns 50 next year. Yay, congrats. That, that's an awesome accomplishment. And thank you so much for providing um, that information uh, to the students or the prospective applicants regarding that background. So we're about to uh, jump right into kind of the LSAT portion of the conversation. Uh, so how does William S. Richardson School of Law regard um, multiple LSAT scores? Um, and how do you view scores related to like the various formats of the LSAT? Absolutely. So when it comes to multiple scores, we'll always give you the benefit of the highest score. Um, when you're looking at uh, multiple scores over time, um, depending on if there's any big discrepancies, we might suggest that you take a moment to provide an addendum just to kind of give us context in this situation. You know, we'll understand that things do happen. Um, it could have been just so, sort of that morning or something happened during the test with a lot of the new um, kind of online tests going on. Things will happen. And so I would like to think that we're very understanding about it. And if you take a, a moment to let us know about it, then at least we'll have that context to view the score. Um, and you know, when it comes to the newer tests, we do understand that different folks will have sort of uh, different resources when it comes to having the space to do it and um, when they can uh, schedule the test just because of um, the other things that they have to take care of in the day. So if anything specific comes up that really needs to be addressed, outside of what that test score is, then um, you know, we always invite applicants to provide us um, an addendum just to let us know what's going on. But otherwise, to the extent that you can do well on the test and only have to do it once, then you know, great for you because you don't have to go through it again. You don't have to necessarily pay for that fee again. And so it's sort of a win-win if you can kind of do it one and done. Awesome. Thank you so much for that information. So would a well-written admissions essay uh, make up for a lower LSAT score? Quick answer to that is possibly. And so uh, when we're looking at an application, the test score only accounts for about a third of that admission decision. Um, and then when it comes to that other third, we're looking at your academic record, which kind of gives us confidence in your academic ability. And that remaining third is sort of covers at everything else, you know, as you put together that personal statement, it really ties in and it's a, a place where that you would advocate for yourself. And so that a compelling story there can um, sort of make up for a lower score. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's uh, more school. And so to the confidence that you can give our admissions committee that you'll be able to do um, well in your courses um, coming into school, then you know that's all to your benefit as well. So it can, but um, I wouldn't say it's a always sort of thing. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so some of our students um, express curiosity as to being that this is a very competitive process, what could they do or show as like an applicant that would allow them to stand out among very other very talented um, applicants or candidates within this process? Really? So sort of to that same theme of really tying together that story. Each of your application pieces will have its moment to shine in the process, right? Um, 
aside from that test score, aside from um, what may have been a majority of your undergraduate work already completed, there are sort of these other pieces that might vary a bit more between students. And so, you know, your personal statement, I think one way to really stand out there is to, um, depending on the school, make sure that you adhere to what they ask in terms of length of the statement and things like that. Um, otherwise, you might stand out in a bad way. Um, answering the question, um, the prompt that they give you. And a lot of times, um, if it's a very open prompt, the one prompt that you might want to make sure you address is at least tying in why law school is this next step for you in your journey. Um, often, if the statement is talking about others or kind of is very vague and that you know reasoning doesn't come across, it's hard to really see the student kind of matriculating to law school at that point, right? And so kind of the different ways that you kind of um, put that together, uh, you know, kind of make sure that it ties everything together. Now, when it comes to your letters of recommendation, um, that's another way for other folks to advocate for you. They work with you in different capacities and they know your uh, work ethic outside of what the, those transcripts or what outside of what that test score has. And so they can really pick out those um, character items about you in terms of um, maybe that grit, maybe that intellectual curiosity, right? Um, if for them to be able to advocate for you in that way, either from an academic setting, a professional setting, or what have they, you know, that can be other ways that you would stand out amongst your peers. And everyone comes in with a unique story. So as you're kind of thinking about the pieces that go into it, you will advocate for yourself in your personal statement one way. And then your letters of recommendation will advocate for you in the different ways that they know you. Now, your resume as well is sort of a place where you can take the time to really mold it to get the most bang for your buck. And when you're thinking about the resume, I think a lot of times we can be very humble about a lot of the things that we do and wanna make sure that you take the time to really um, put in those sort of uh, details that would be very helpful uh, for the committee to know. You know, you might have a title there, you might have a company there, and outside of that, unless you've really told us sort of the important things you do there, we might not know it. And so it's very helpful um, to be able to at least um, think of it like a, trying to set those uh, descriptions to really have concrete um, words that talk about what you do, what you've achieved and things like that. All of that will be very helpful to stand out aside from, you know, a lot of what you've done in um, your uh, university and a lot of that test score as well. So that's where you really kind of folks really uh, bloom in a sense when we look at the application. Thank you so much. Um, and I, th I think you really helped me transition um, to the next part of the conversation regarding aspects of the application. I know you mentioned or provided really great insight as to keeping like the personal statement uh, short and concise or in line into what the um, qualifications or what is asked and for students to answer the questions. Um, so also within that, um, some students might have issues or concerns or questions regarding like what topics to choose regarding their um, personal statements. So could you provide like some common topics that uh, students might gravitate towards or those that they might need to avoid um, in order to really um, make effective statements? Sure, so an effective statement is focused on you. I think a lot of a one misstep can always be you're focusing on someone else or something else that you really forget to tie yourself into that personal statement. And, and you got to keep it personal. Um, and so even if what you're describing this event or, you know, this other person that really led or inspired you to sort of this pathway on law, um, do mention them, but don't make the focus on them. Spend more time on yourself, and especially depending on the statement where you have a limited amount of space, you want to be able to get that message across. Um, some of the other kind of do's and don'ts that you might consider for that personal statement would be just making sure you've really um, double checked uh, that spell check and as well as a school check. Sometimes, you know, if um, you're applying to multiple schools, maybe another school name falls in there. That is one of the easier things that you can really work through. Um, and then, you know, when you're working with any peers to kind of get a little bit of review on that, um, there's quite a balance between trying to, um, it might be our 
inclination sometimes to put on paper what we think the admissions committee wants to know um, or wants to see, and we kind of lose our authentic self. And so, you know, when you're working with peers and getting feedback, you know, the folks who know you well will definitely tell us uh, or help you know that, you know, who's coming off paper is the person that I know. You've remained authentic to yourself. The folks who read it that might be coming from an, uh, a different perspective of not knowing you too well, they can tell you who comes off the paper. And in that sense, you can see whether or not you've really uh, come across on paper the way you want to be seen by maybe an even admissions committee or a director of admissions who um, probably doesn't know you more than just what's on the paper there. So really trying to remain authentic, but also um, not falling for those small traps there. Um, the other thing I do want to mention is um, when you're working with uh, another person who might review a personal statement to kind of just reorganize and or and just make sure things are coming across correctly, um, they will really help you to kind of finalize that story. Um, when you're looking at a personal statement, sometimes we're really doing chronologically or this or that. And um, sometimes the way it comes across, sort of the that fine art to sometimes can be helpful um, in the context of the larger application. Thank you so much for that response. So regarding uh, the diversity statement, um, if someone is unsure as to whether or not they should submit the um, statement as in most instances it is optional, how would you advise them about or on whether or not they should include that in their application? Diversity statement can be a helpful piece as long as you're not being redundant in the application. You know, there might be different ways to include all of this uh, interesting information about you in different parts of the application, um, depending on what questions are already included in the application outside of a formal statement. Um, maybe you've already kind of tied it into your personal statement, or maybe that diversity that you bring um, comes with working with someone who is already writing you a letter of recommendation, right? So as you're kind of looking through the different pieces, there might be opportunities where it doesn't really come across in any other part of the application, and this is your opportunity to do so. And if that's the case, then absolutely, go ahead and submit that diversity statement. What we don't know um, can't quite benefit you. So if it's um, not in the application, um, we won't know it. And so if that's the opportunity for you to do it, um, then submit a diversity statement. Thank you. So the next statement, um, another optional piece, the addendum. Um, so um, what um, could you cite examples of when you would advise someone to submit an addendum if an applicant, for example, is uncertain as to whether or not they should include that piece within their application? Um, what would be um, your recommendation? So the addendum is um, similar to what um, you might think for that diversity statement. It really um, cover something that um, isn't already covered. So there's a few places that an addendum might be necessary. Um, so maybe it's your test, right? You need to give us context rather than just the number itself, give us context of what happened at that point in time. Um, if you need to provide an LSAT or GRE addendum, since we're also a GRE school, then um, you can provide a couple paragraphs there to um, let us know. Um, in terms of academics, you might provide an academic addendum. You know, um, maybe your transition into university um, was rocky at best, especially, you know, um, during the pandemic or even um, just within, um, if you're finishing your degree during the pandemic, there probably were likely these bumpy patches there, you know, taking a moment to just describe how that transition or poor transition in a way may have affected your academics. Um, and then the other might be for character and fitness. Um, Depending on the question, we might require you to provide an addendum to kind of talk through the facts there. And that um, you'll provide an addendum uh, to meet that requirement. Um, in terms of any other addendum, um, that information probably might fall under a diversity statement more so. But when it comes to the addendum, typically a couple of paragraphs really getting to the point, the most successful ones will be the ones that really come to a conclusion, but also sort of talk about how it has shaped you as an applicant today, rather than um, the person then that was kind of dealing with that situation. Because at the end of the day, um, it is the person you are today and moving forward that is going to be admitted to law school 
and not um, the person maybe two, three, or even five years ago that may have just had this one rough semester, but has otherwise proven themselves, had this upward trend, has have been doing everything right since then, and deserves to be in law school. Awesome, thank you. So what is your process um, when looking at an application? So our process when it comes to the application is um, after you submit it, you should receive within a week um, an acknowledgement that we received the application. Typically our process will go through a review through an admissions committee. And then in approximately six to eight weeks time, typically more on the eight week end, uh, we'll have a decision available and the applicant will find out both by their online status page as well as by email. Um, and along the way, the online status page is a great way for them to just kind of see, you know, has everything been received? Um, do I need to resubmit any documents? Um, am I way past this eight week timeline? Do I need to nudge the admissions folks to see, just make sure, you know, I haven't fallen through the cracks in their system. But for the most part, um, that is in general. Um, I think the one piece I forgot to mention is um, once we receive the application, we do sort of have a verification period just to make sure that we have all the things we need. Um, sometimes maybe that one transcript sort of um, keeps your CAS report from coming through. And so your online status page is really helpful in that case to make sure you can check that. What am I missing? Um, get that into the Law School Admission Council so that everything can kind of flow through. Perfect. Um, so I know um, watching will be numerous um, students who might consider themselves to be non-traditional students. Um, how does um, admissions um, view that at the law school? Non-traditional applicants are always encouraged to apply and not feel intimidated by this process if they haven't been in school for a little bit of time. Um, the things that non-traditional students bring to the table are often their life experiences and work experiences and sort of other accomplishments they have in the particular field that they've often been working in or really developing those skills in for the last how many years. So they shouldn't be afraid of the process. They should be um, sort of uh, encouraged because they bring something to the table that probably a lot of other students don't. Um, that being said, when we're looking at non-traditional applicants, the shift might be a little less from you know, the academic record since that is a little further back, we'll consider any graduate work. Um, and we'll also consider the resume as sort of the accomplishments that are probably more recent. And so taking all of that together, and of course the test score is gonna be within that five year period, taking all of that together, um, they are sort of evaluated for their success in um, school. Now, even while in school and upon graduation, we hear that a lot of employers do appreciate having non-traditional students sort of um, join them in the work that they do. Um, they have this sort of proven track record of um, having worked and even if they are working and going to school at the same time and successfully, you know, completing law school while going to work, you know, that really shows um, some type of grit, some type of determination to really make it all happen. And that can be really helpful in terms of um, students applying for work and getting employed after graduation. So. Non-traditional applicants, um, we have them all the time and um, they should be encouraged to apply to law school if that's really something that is the next step for them in their career. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that question, um, would it be encouraged that if they might have more recent work experience, they get letters of recommendations from their like employers or supervisors, or should they seek um, those letters from their professors from um, their institutions that they came from? Um, the former would be just fine, and it's probably a bit more practical, especially if it's been, for some folks, a decade since they were last in school. That reference might not be kind of the, the most useful. You know, if, if you're trying to ask a professor who's had thousands of students to um, try and remember you, um, even though you're a standout student, um, it might be a bit difficult for them to. And um, you don't blame them because, they, you know, they, they're working with many students at the same time. So definitely a supervisor or um, an employer letter is just fine. Oftentimes, even um, folks that they work with in a professional um, setting can be a good letter. At the end of the day, if it is a strong letter, as um, we would typically like to say, if you ask them and you ask them uh, specifically for a strong letter of recommendation 
and they don't hesitate to say yes, then it's probably going to be a good letter and a helpful letter um, that will be used in the application. Great. Now we'll kind of transition to the school experience uh, portion of this conversation. Um, so what kind of student would be considered the right fit um, for William S. Richardson School of Law? Um, for the law school here, the right fit is typically someone who um, has an interest in our program areas. So we have uh, four main certificates, um, environmental law, international law, Pacific Asian law, and native Hawaiian law. And so um, folks who are interested in those areas definitely um, are seen as a fit for the school, but um, also folks um, who have ties to Hawaii, you know, folks, uh, we are a state school and it's part of our mission um, to serve the people of Hawaii and the greater Pacific. And so in that case, you know, that mission driven approach does kind of tie into kind of what makes a fit for a student. Um, and students who are just um, told that story to us about, you know, why law school, um, sometimes they have shown sort of that determination they have shown that law school is the next step for them. And we still welcome strong students um, who may not particularly have specific ties to the state. At the end of the day, more, most of our applicants are actually not, um, are actually out of state. Um, and then when we admit students, it's pretty, uh, it's been pretty equal in terms of um, the number of students with particular ties and those who are out of state. At the end of the day, um, at, when, all is said and done, a uh, good number of our students um, are from Hawaii at the end of the day. Great, thank you so much. Um, so most of the world has been impacted by, impacted by the uh, COVID pandemic, and now it seems as though we're getting to that post-pandemic phase. Um, but um, several students would like to know, um, how has COVID impacted the law school experience? experience? Um, the law school experience itself, I would say it's really pushed us and um, to include a, a little bit more of the online component in terms of access to professors and or sort of class materials. And in the, not that uh, we're continuing to be online, we, we've been back in person since earlier this year, but um, we've been a bit more flexible when it comes to having access or providing access to um, students, current students as well as prospective students. A lot of, um, our information sessions that we had, you know, during the pandemic, we continue to have now, and it's probably not the easiest thing to, you know, fly out to Hawaii to come and tour and meet with admissions, but um, definitely the, the remote access through um, digital platforms has been really helpful to us to really reach out to folks as far away. You know, the time difference, we can't quite change, but at least um, it's brought us closer to a lot of folks in terms of access to ask us the questions they need to get the clarification they need um, so that they can successfully complete our application. Awesome. So what is your favorite thing about the institution? You know, it's probably what everyone's going to say, but I, you can't just beat the people here. You know, it's um, the students that come in, they are um, definitely hungry and they are going to be competitive, but they are also very supportive of one another, you know. Um, at the end of the day, everyone knows that we're sort of um, going to get to graduation together. And so the students and as well as the faculty, they are some of the best people you'll meet. And I think, um, you know, if we ever got a, a law professor to come and interview uh, with you folks, then you would definitely see sort of um, the support they get there. Um, even the rest of our staff have noticed, you know, the amount of support that the students get seems um, almost, I don't want to say unfair, almost unprecedented in comparison to some other graduate programs here. And so I think the people taking care of one another, that's kind of what it's all about. And that's one of my favorite things about um, us being here. Amazing. So if a student is nervous to reach out to the admissions office, um, what is your advice for those who need additional information or help? Yeah, absolutely. My advice is we're nice people. Please reach out to us. And so um, sometimes if, you know, reaching out to admissions um, person directly might seem a bit intimidating. 
then you might see if they have student ambassadors, you know, maybe sharing something with someone who is adjacent to, but not directly in the admissions office, maybe that would be more interesting, uh, I guess, a, a little less intimidating to kind of talk and get that clarification. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you need the specific admission information and it's not clear on the website and you need that clarification, um, reach out to us, send us an email, call into us, um, join our information sessions. Um, there's always gonna be an opportunity to connect with us. Um, and you know, making sure you do that up front so that you can um, complete the application correctly definitely saves us a few emails at the end of the day uh, when it comes to the application and make sure that you're not delaying your application because if um, you know maybe something got misinterpreted along the way, we have to ask you to clarify that and then you just kind of lost maybe a week in the process. Um, and sometimes knowing when or if you've gotten into law school can make a difference in terms of sort of any logistical arrangements that have, have to happen after that. You know, as you're working with your timeline and if we get born into the summer and we're delaying you by another week and you gotta move to Hawaii, right? Um, then, you know, one week more of planning than um, having that would probably be more helpful than um, because you've reached out to us, you've asked your question than um, if you are um, just to try to do it on your own. So yeah, reach out to us. I would like to think uh, we're very, uh, responsive, um, either by email or by phone. So yeah, let us know. Thank you. And for my final question, how can we reach you? Um, email number? Yeah, the, I would say the best way to reach out is by email at lawadm, so L-A-W-A-D-M at hawaii.edu. Um, and even if you're on our website at law.hawaii.edu, you'll find our admissions page that will give you lots of information as well as access to our information sessions. Um, and that's, um, like I mentioned, we're still on Zoom so that folks can reach out to us from all the time zones. Um, we're typically having both a lunchtime hour here, so about dinner time on the East Coast, um, as well as our evening sessions. We do have about 5.30 here or maybe a little later in the evening on the West Coast. So um, other opportunities to join in with us and sort of our future activities. Amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with us today. We truly appreciate it. Thanks for having me again, Tia. Take care, everybody.